This is the Financial Sense News Hour with the president of PFS Group, Jim Poplava. Since 1982, PFS Group has offered asset management and educational resources that have helped investors build, maintain, and preserve their wealth. Now, here's the Financial Sense News Team, Jim Poplava and John Leffler. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second part of a special edition of the Financial Sense News Hour. As I mentioned in the first hour, we were putting together a special program, and I was trying to get together individuals in the industry together with Commissioner Bart Chilton. Unfortunately, that did not happen. We just couldn't get everybody's schedules to mesh. So I did do a separate interview with Commissioner Chilton earlier in the year, and now what we're going to do in this hour is we're going to take some of the clips of my interview with the commissioner and I've invited Dave Morgan from Silver Investor in the Morgan Report and Eric Sprott from Sprott Securities and I've asked them to respond to some specific questions that dealt with silver manipulation, dealt with uh, over-concentrated short positions in some of the anomalies that have gone on in the silver market and get each of them uh, to comment to the Commissioner's response because I do believe that Commissioner Chilton is trying to do a good job. This is sort of what we call our virtual roundtable since we couldn't get everybody together all at once but what you're going to hear now is both Dave Morgan and Eric Sprott comment on what the commissioner responded to me in the questions that I asked. Commissioner, I want to start out. You've been on record and you've been conducting an ongoing investigation of what might appear to be manipulation of the silver market. You have testified over the last couple of years. And I'm taking a quote here. There have been fraudulent efforts to persuade and deviously control that price. Commissioner, what are the factors that lead you to that conclusion? Well, Jim, in general, people have emailed me over the years, but this dates back all the way to 2007 and then significantly in 2008. And they would predict that prices would move up or down based upon what they saw in the market. And uh, while this did not occur 100% of the time, it occurred significantly enough that it made my antenna go up, and I started asking our uh, Division of Market Oversight to surveil the matter and to look at it, which they, they do in general, Jim, on, on all the markets, but with a specific regard to when I would get these emails that would forecast such price changes. So it's based upon public information and uh, things that I've received, actually, from individuals across the country, in fact, across the world, that I believe that uh, some of these things have gone on that y- you mentioned there in my statement. Eric? Well, Jim, uh, I'm sure he's referring to, well, when, the, when I hear a conversation like that, the thing I think of is Andrew McGuire, who, of course, uh, sent letters to the uh, SEC saying that uh, the price of silver will be bombed on this particular day at this particular minute, and sure enough, it happened. And uh, when Andrew McGuire went back to the SEC and said, well, did you get it? Uh, What are you going to do about it? Of course, there was uh, blank uh, stares and faces all around and nothing happened. And I guess various people have uh, written into Commissioner Chilton and he's partially buying in. But I find it a little surprising that uh, if you even partially bought in as one of the five commissioners, you might think that you might press the issue a little harder. As we all know, there's already lawsuits charging HSBC and uh, J.P. Morgan with manipulating the the silver market in 2008. That's in the public domain, so there's nothing new there that anyone can't uh, research. And also, there's a four-year or three-and-a-half-year investigation into manipulation of the silver price by the CME with no conclusion. So, yes, I can see why he would imagine that could happen, and I do appreciate that he made a very blunt statement about what he thought might have happened, and it will be interesting to see whether it plays out exactly as he stated, that there have been fraudulent efforts to manipulate the price of silver. Dave? Well, I appreciate, you know, the fact that he takes it to heart and that they've been, you know, he asked the Division of Market Oversight to look into the matter. The problem I have with it is how long they have to look. I mean, it's pretty straightforward that the rules that are already established require that there be limits and these limits are being overrun. Now, it is a bit technical because there are a couple of categories. First category is basically your speculative category 
and then there's a true hedger category. The hedger category doesn't have exemptions, but they have bonuses, I'll call them. This is my word, bonus. The bonus is if you're a bona fide hedger by their definition, meaning the CFTC's definition, you do not have to put up as much margin as you do if you are speculated. So you get like a 30% gift, meaning that you are only required to put up 70% as much capital as the speculator is. So that's a bonus right there. The other bonus is that they don't really have a certified amount that they can hedge if you are considered to be a true hedger. The problem with all of that is it's an unfair playing field. And secondly, who is determining whether or not someone is a certified hedger or not? Most of the true hedging that goes on through these markets are through the base metal companies. These are, for an example, your BHP. Now, these companies produce a tremendous amount of silver. However, commensurate with their bottom line, in other words, how much it actually produces a profit in the company is almost ridiculous. I did a study several years back, so I want to give the idea, but not the exact number because numbers change, and I haven't done this study in quite a while. But I looked at silver like tripling, and with that huge 300% increase in the price of silver, the bottom line increase into a BHP was almost insignificant because silver is such a small, small, small portion of what they mine out of the ground. But silver is a small market, and what they take out of the silver market, excuse me, what they produce in a given year is significant. So I hope I'm making a lot of sense here on how these really big conglomerates mine a great deal of silver, yet they have very little interest in the metal, so they turn that interest over to bullion banks for the most part. Now, the bullion banks now have this exemption to go in and hedge, I'll put that in quotation marks, the silver market, which gives them, I believe, a huge advantage because they know basically what the majority of the silver production is going to be. They also have no restrictions on can they hedge one year, five years, 10 years, 50 years. There is no limit. So all these things have to be really considered. I'm not sure how deeply the CFTC has actually looked into that aspect of it. I've thought about this for years. I haven't really written about it in a long time because my view is that the bureaucracy that exists is not going to take action in a sufficient amount of time where it's actually going to do us any good. I hate to sound negative, but that's my take. It's opinion only. But so far, we are still waiting. You know, since I've been investing in the silver market over the last decade, Commissioner, there appears to be at least three to four large entities that make up most of the short positions in silver. And I don't know if it's simply a large bank that is representing its clients. For example, it could be hedge funds or some large institutions. But at times, some would argue these positions have been so concentrated Does that strike you as being odd sometimes when they get that large? I wish it was odd. It's actually not odd because it's been so prevalent, Jim. It's deeply concerning. I mean, these monsters of the market are at sometimes 25, 30 percent of a market. Now, there are folks out there and even people, some people at the CFTC, but there are analysts out there who will say that 25 or 30 percent of the market isn't a problem. But I am just absolutely convinced that that significant concentration can push markets around, up or down. And that's why the commission just recently and then the last couple of months has approved uh, limits on the concentration that can be held by any one trader. Dave? Well, this one really gets to me. First of all, there is limits on the long side. The long side, of course, is that you're buying silver. And as a quick example, and you'll have to read it to verify this, but if you go to the rules on silver at their website, you'll find that you can only have 1,500 contracts available to any long trader. So that's um, 7.5 million ounces of silver. That's it. It's a limit. It's in writing. When you sign up to get a futures account, that's what you're signing into. So there is a concentration limit. For the longs, but on the short, there is no limit, basically, as we talked about in the previous question. But I want to drill down on this concentration situation a little bit deeper, because Jim, as you know, and most of the listeners know, I have a fairly good background in the commodity sector. There's a gentleman that is named Ken Roberts. Ken uh, 
based in Oregon. In fact, one of my futures brokers, one of the two that I have that are in Chicago, used to work for Ken. Ken has been quite a successful commodities trader over the years. In fact, he used to sell some educational products along those lines. And when he really got started in the commodities, and not at a really deep level, he was in the cattle market. And he was, I believe, if I remember the story right, he was very pretty young, and I think he was still in college, but you can scratch that, that's from my memory. He was taking such a good position, edging into the market, accumulating positions, that the authorities came to pay him a visit because he was too big a player in such a small market. In other words, the concentration on the long side was concerning them that one player could influence the market that much. If one player can influence or concentration can influence the market, and it can, there's no doubt about that, then they have to look at both sides. They have to look at a concentration on the long side, and they have to look at the concentration on the short side. And yet, they continually seem to only be able to focus on any concentration from the long side. For example, oil, you know, uh, that was the speculators who were causing the price rise. Well, it was more buying and selling, and that is what moved the price up. And speculation probably did have something to do with it. But it seems as if they're blinded to the short side. The market works both ways. The commodities market is really the only zero-sum game investing that I know of. In the stock market, you can be in an investment, and if the business actually grows, all investors can get you know more, can build their wealth. But in the commodities market, for every long there's a short, for every winner there's a loser, and it's almost it's a zero-sum game. If I win a hundred, you lose a hundred. If we're on the opposite side of the same contract, so that really does bother me that he give an answer that that's the status quo and it's too bad and that's the way it's been because it isn't that way in all the markets. Uh, it has become that way uh, in a lot of the markets. I don't want to disagree with them totally, but it's something that they should have been on top of a long, long time ago. And again, it goes back to their basic rule book. I mean, they should read their own rule book and see what it says about concentration. Eric? Well, yes, that was suggested that they would impose that limit. Of course, it got, it's already been pushed out. I think they're not even going to consider it until June again. And it's it's incredibly obvious, you know, that the person who's done the best work on this is Ted Butler, and I, he, you know, he's made comparisons between the largest positions in oil versus the largest positions in silver, and you know, the oil positions are nothing like twenty five to forty percent. It's almost incredulous that anyone would need to be short that amount of silver. I mean, we're talking uh, two hundred to uh, three hundred and fifty million ounces. Uh, everyone's aware that's done the analysis that these four or five institutions taken those positions. That's what caused those lawsuits to be launched uh, regarding 2008. I think that's what's caused the investigation to be launched by the CME that's been ongoing for three and a half years. So there's no doubt that uh, the silver market has got a, a massive over-concentration of shorts. And I really credit all the work to uh, Ted Butler, who's kind of gone there to expose the various things that have gone on in the market. You know, Eric, it's interesting that you bring that up in any talks about uh, this position, which at times can represent up to 30, 35% of the market. About two uh, weeks ago, there was a one-day event in the market where 45,000 contracts of silver were sold short, representing 225 million ounces of silver. Now, what is strange about that and what I find, I guess, mystifying is there's only about a little over 30 million ounces for delivery against that short position. So to me, allowing whatever entities, these two or three entities that are involved in this, to short that much silver when there's not that much available. For example, Eric, what would happen if someone like yourself was on the buy side and said, you know, I'd like that silver. <laughs> you, you wouldn't be able to get it. It's actually one of my missions in life, quite frankly. But the more interesting thing, even, you know, you mentioned the roughly 225 million ounces of silver that traded with annual production of about 900 million ounces. So, but, but the interesting thing is it occurred in one hour. And to imagine that at one quarter of the world's silver production was traded in one hour is almost beyond belief. Two... When GFMS and uh, other groups put out the silver data, they say that the, I think last year, for example, the amount of money invested for investment purposes in silver was something estimated to be 179 million ounces for the whole year. 
And yet 225 million ounces trades in one hour, and I think that day we traded well over half a billion ounces. So, I mean, the numbers just don't make any sense in the real world. What purpose could there be other than to try to drive the price down? There, is, there could be no other purpose. Nobody in their right mind would sell silver down the $4 that it was sold down in such a short time period if they're trying to make a profit or trying to not incur as much loss, and nobody would have sold gold down by 100 bucks in that very brief time over which that occurred. Eric, could you see a date in the future sometime where on the opposite side of that trade, obviously if these entities are coming in and they're selling this quantity, almost a quarter percentage of the annual production of silver in a single hour, where on the receiving side somebody would want to take delivery, where we're going to have some kind of disruptive event in the market where somebody's going to call these shorts on it and they won't be able to deliver And if that's the case, then what will that say about the sanctity of our futures markets where you want to go in and you want to think you want to take delivery on a position, but you can't get it because so many things have been sold short, they just can't honor it? Well, most of us who look at the commodity markets just can't believe the volume. I mean, it's just it bears no relationship to reality. And the fact is, Jim, uh, you know, somebody sold six billion of silver in an hour. (laughs) I mean, nobody even produces that much There's no single producer that produces that much in a year, let alone selling it in an hour. So I would say it's a joke of major proportions here. I intend to actually uh, make a comment on that in my forthcoming Markets at a Glance, because anybody who could put one and one together would realize that what goes on in the commodity exchange does not represent what goes on in the real world. One, nobody has that amount of silver. It's almost shocking in a way, you know, that there were buyers there for that. And to your point, if a few people get some resolve and decide to take delivery, of course, it would be impossible to deliver that amount of silver. So I think that over time, as people continue to buy silver, and I always find it interesting that if you look at U.S. mean statistics, if you look at the statistics of the last two tranches of our silver trust, when I look at what we do at Sprott Money, people buy silver in a ratio to gold of 50 to 1 in physical volume. 50 to 1. The availability for investment purposes is something less than 6.5 to 1. They cannot keep buying at that level when there's that little silver available. And you probably are aware that even the, the people who caused this downturn, of course, last week covered a lot of their shorts. I mean, it's so obvious <laughs> what's going on, and yet seemingly the authorities don't seem prepared to do anything about it. But given the passage of time, And knowing what's going on and knowing the reasons to own gold and silver and seeing what people do, I have no doubt that these physical buyers will, in time, overwhelm the paper sellers. I wanted to focus in once again on monopolistic practices through this concentration of two or three short sellers, especially when you are in the futures market where you start off to begin with, you're leveraged 10 to 1, but imagine if you had sizable amounts of capital And, you know, 30% of a market almost, you know, I can see cases sometimes going before the courts in in terms of monopolistic practices when one particular firm or entity controls that much of a market, they really move the market in terms of its price. I definitely think it's possible, and I, I think it's been done in the past. Now, you know, manipulation has a legal definition, and so... While you and I may just be talking and saying that uh, the price of this or that was certainly manipulated, that's not a lawyer speaking. That's, you know, just an average person, like talking with our neighbors. So when you get to the law, you actually have to show several things, including intent, including, so intent to manipulate, and you got to prove it in court. So if you're the government and I say, Jim, I think you manipulated the market, I've got to show, you know, an email or a wiretap or you know, a handwritten note or something that showed that you intended to manipulate it. I also have to show that you had the concentration, the market power to do so. So if you had 30%, that is obviously enough. And then finally, I have to show that you were successful in that effort. So it's, it's three pieces of a prong that you would have had to have proven in order to take an action, a prosecutorial action with regard to manipulation. Now, the Dodd-Frank law that passed in 2010 lessened the hurdle that we have to clear as part of government 
with regard to manipulation. But it's still tougher than I think it should be, and I'm hopeful that we are going to go after anybody and everybody who we believe has manipulated the market. Dave, your response? This is a tough one because obviously he's correct as far as what is the legal definition. I think that the first point is the toughest one. I'm not certain that you would have to have an email or a wiretap or a note as he expressed. It's possible. Certainly if you had any of those, it would be much, much beneficial to the case that the manipulation was you know, taking place. You'd have some hard evidence. I'm not sure that's totally required. It's pretty obvious the market's been moved around. I actually don't like the word manipulation, but of course that's what these lawsuits are about. Regardless, the market is moved around and Again, to prove it, that's where I really do have a tough time. I do not have a real strong legal background. I had contract law through my master's degree, and that was it. Studied that course pretty hard, by the way, but that doesn't make me any expert. So that is where I am a little bit concerned that even though most of us that have watched this market so carefully for so long know what's going on, to be able to prove it in a court of law and make it stick, I don't know, pretty tough. But yet, I think that uh, there's probably enough evidence over so many years by so many people for so long a period of time that there's probably enough there that uh, they can make it stick. Eric? Yeah, Jim, my comments would be this. I mean, he's taking a very legalistic approach to the definition of manipulation. And, you know, are there emails and this sort of thing? But the other two things that he suggested were, one, concentration, and two, success. And obviously, the concentration is so available to us. I mean, in the recent example, when we traded 225 million ounces in an hour, I mean, if we can't believe that that is massively excessive, and fine, go and tell me who put the orders in that wanted to sell it, or or did you just trade it on your trading desk? That would be very easy to determine. And I'm sure a court of law, if they asked whomever it was that sold it, why did you need to sell 225 million ounces of silver that way? If you don't have a contract from people producing silver or some other bona fide reason to do it, we can only assume that you meant to push the price down. Of course, the other argument he made is success. Obviously, we've seen now many examples, but the two most blatant are the most recent, the Feb 29th leap year hit, and the uh, spring 11 hit when we're at 4950 and in a six-minute time span, you know, the price, sorry, a 13-minute time span, the price of silver is down $6. Those tell you exactly what the success is. And this recent one, we already know they covered, I think the number was something like 40 million ounces uh, subsequent to the Feb 29th smash. So obviously there's success there. We don't need to debate that whatsoever. And I would think in a court of law, if you ask 12 jurors, does it look like this person was overreaching the bounds of reasonableness, I would venture to say they, that they would conclude that he was. Dave, what about this issue? He's talking there about uh, concentration of a few players, and of course you have to have the evidence that there's an intent. What about two weeks ago, where in a 10-12 minute period, you had 45,000 contracts sold short in such a, a short period of time, where you had those 45,000 contracts representing 225 million ounces of silver, which it's my understanding there was only about a little over 30 million ounces of silver that were available for delivery. That, to me, stands out as a case of manipulation, and it would seem to be pretty clear-cut. Why would anybody sell that kind of amount of silver in such a concentrated effort of selling in such a short period of time. No person that I know that would be a legitimate buyer trying to impact the price would sell or buy in that manner. I agree, and I have just a little bit to add on. When we did that interview that's on your website regarding how many contracts were actually sold on that day, and we referenced the 45,000 contracts, what I actually got from my broker was the the actual number, and it's actually much larger. The actual number on that day was 110,000 contracts, and that represents 550 million ounces, 550 million ounces of silver. That is three-quarters of the world's annual production during one trading day, and most of it during a very short period of time during that trading day. Now, think about that for a minute. If that doesn't by itself stand alone as a fact of manipulation, I don't know what would. Because if I were defending the case or presenting the case as the prosecutor and saying, look, there is manipulation, 
I would say that this is how markets work, and we've been through that too many times, and this is what was done. So markets move on concentration. This is total concentration. Anyone with half a brain knows it's going to move the market down, and the market did move down. What was the motive? Two motives, probably. One, to move the market down. That goes without question. Second motive, to profit from it. And we went over that on our previous interview. We talked about this. So for the record, I just want to update that. The reason I used the 225 thousand number, Jim, was because that was on the internet, and I didn't really want to contradict any of my friends until I had the actual number, and the number they derived was you know, pretty decent at the time. They were looking, I think, at an intraday chart, and that was a pretty good rounding number, but the actual number was basically 550 million ounces on paper, and as you say, Jim, that was backed by the total amount of 35 million ounces that is held by the dealers as, as in total. That's all four registered dealers with the CME, which is only four banks. Their total inventory combined is only $35 million. And yet we had 550 million ounces sold in one trading day. I don't know what else I can say, Jim. It's gone on far too long. I just think that this idea that they're going to kick this thing down the road and push out the position limits till June is just another situation that we are contending with through the whole financial system, pretending that this debt doesn't matter or we can correct it and continue to kick the can down the road as the expression goes. CFTC is right in line with this. They're just delaying, stalling. They're not facing up to their responsibility as far as I'm concerned. You know, something that has puzzled me, Eric, is, and this goes back to manipulation from a Ponzi scheme, but I want to go back to Bernie Madoff where Harry Marco Polo's went to the SEC, to the Boston SEC in 2001, presented them the case on a silver platter, then went to the New York SEC, presented them with obvious manipulation. So as you just responded, you said, look, it's clear we've got concentration, two or three players that are doing this, and it was successful. It did bring the price of silver down. So Have you been puzzled somewhat why the government is so slow to move against it? I mean, for the average person, seeing this continuous thing, and let me add one more thing. Looking at a a price of silver, silver has been on a 45-degree angle after the big takedown that we saw in April and May. And it seems to me, Eric, every time it gets close to 40, which is almost like a breakout, we got another slam down in September, and then we're back up, moving towards that $40 mark, and we got that slam down. What is it about $40 silver they're afraid of? Well, it's interesting, Jim. When I look back to Feb 29th, and I was sort of watching it almost to the minute at the time, and I would say everything was breaking out. Gold was breaking out. Silver was breaking out. The mining indexes, the GDX and the GDXJ were all breaking out. And bang, right at 10 o'clock, they all failed. And Am I surprised that this happens? No, I'm, I'm not at all surprised because I believe, and, and I'm not the only person to believe this, is that there is a kind of managed a retreat by the powers that be that don't want gold and silver to assume the role that they're going to assume, which is to be the reserve currency. And, you know, we've already gone up five or 600% here in the price of gold in the last uh, 12 years. But... You know, it's been a very trying time for all of us, you know, with all this massive volatility. No one's made it easy for anyone to own gold, particularly the weak hands, because you see these sudden sell-offs and, you know, you sort of wonder why I'm invested in this. So, no, I'm not surprised that uh, these things happen. I happen to be in a school where I think it's most likely, and I hope they prove in court, that it's been very orchestrated. And I think about the fact that it almost goes down every time a jobs number is reported, which it did uh, this last week. And I think, well, why is it that day? Like, and I sort of decided, well, the reason it's that day is because you need a time when everyone's focusing on a number and everyone knows that's when we're going to do it. <laughs> because you don't have other times when necessarily there's a data point that you know could be misinterpreted or or basically the firing gun, if you will. Okay, this is when we're going to knock it down. So I'm not surprised at all to see what goes on. And uh, it's disgusting in a lot of ways. I personally believe that when they have a trial on manipulation, there is likely to be ample evidence that that is the case. So all we can do is continue to buy, knowing that it's undervalued, knowing that 
the market has already made gold a reserve currency, and by definition, silver will become a currency in due course. Here's another thing that strikes me, I guess maybe the futures market, and this is once again going back to some that say that there's something wrong here. World silver production, Bart, is about 750 million ounces a day. In some days in the futures market, we may trade a billion ounces of, let's say, paper silver in terms of contract. So the paper market is so much larger than the physical market. Couldn't that create a potential problem, for example, when you hear a story like MF Global, which I want to get to in a moment, but if the paper market is concerned about counterparty risk and they say, you know what, I don't want this paper I'm owning anymore, I want the fiscal, what happens when there's so many more contracts or the contracts are allowed to get in either direction, either on the short side or on the long side, they become so large that how do you deliver into that? Well, a couple of things, Jim. You know, one, and people don't realize this, but, you know, the futures are always many times the physical. And it depends on what the commodity is, but I think the average, somebody told me, was like 10 times. So the futures trade at 10 times the physical on average. So there's not an equal number. As many people as want to trade whatever it is, silver or corn or oil, as long as there is people on each side of the trade, they can create futures contracts, unlimited. But secondly, you raise a point that I think is important, and I'm sad to say I think not looked at at this agency as much as it should, and that is, what is the physical supply? You and I may be in the same age cohort. There used to be a show, a television show, a sitcom called Chico and the Man, and there was an actor named Freddie Prince who oh, yeah. was the heartthrob of somebody I worked with. And Freddie Prince used to say, it's not my job. It's not my job. And I think that's how the agency for a long time, Jim, looked at the physical market, that it's not their job, that it's just the futures. But they are integrally entwined, and unless we have that view, I don't think we're doing the job we need to do. So I've been a big proponent for ensuring that we are looking at the physical, despite what I said about how futures trade many times. And then the last point, Jim, real quickly, is that there are exemptions that have heretofore, these are exemptions from limits or accountability levels that have existed. These are accountability levels, what we call the back months and position limits in the spot month. So we don't yet have position limits in the back months or aggregate position limits, but we do have currently in silver and in all the other markets that are traded, we have the spot month limits. But there's been exemptions to those, and those exemptions have been approved by the exchanges. And the exchanges, while I'm not saying they do a bad job, they have a different motive than we do in government as the regulator. They have a profit motive as opposed to just a good market motive and a good government motive. And that profit motive, I think, lends that exemption policy to sort of a more cavalier attitude towards granting exemptions. And here's the good news, Jim, finally, I'm making my point, is that we have changed that. No longer in the future will the exchanges grant any such exemptions. That The agency would have to grant those exemptions. I hope they'll be few and far between. But to your question about physical, that exemption, if we were to grant one, would have to be based upon the legitimate business needs, and that could include the physical, if it's silver or if it's gold or what have you, that the entity might hold. So they would have to, I've used it around here in the building, I've said they'd have to do it like Bruce Springsteen sings. They'd have to prove it all night. They'd have to prove that they need the exemption, and they would prove that, they could prove that through showing what they have in the physical. I'm sorry if that's such a long answer, but it's a fulsome answer, Jim, if nothing else. Eric? Well, Jim, maybe I could comment here. Um, First of all, I think you said we produce 750 million ounces a day. Yeah, and you meant 750 million ounces a year. And by the way, that points up a big difference, right? Because Commissioner Chilton said most commodities trade 10 times more than what's produced. On days when it trades a billion, it's trading, and I'm using a 250-day work here, by the way, or trading here. It trades 325 times bigger than what is produced. 
and it probably trades, if I was to do some quick math here, probably traded um, something like, uh, let me do the math here, probably traded something like 1,300 times the amount of silver that was available for investment that day, 1,300 times. Here's the thing that blows me away. Now, he's making a reference there that they're no longer going to grant these exemptions. So let's go back to two weeks ago, Eric, where in in a, about a 10, 12-minute period, somebody sold 500 million ounces plus silver sold short. They must have got an exemption. And for what reason? They, they didn't get an exemption. I'll tell you what happened subsequent to uh, Commissioner Chilton's uh, discussion with you. The reporting period for silver transactions was pushed out to June. I thought it was going to end at the end of February. From that point on, they had to report you know, what their positions were. But they made some rulings somewhere between January and February that people didn't have to report. They didn't have to begin that reporting process till sometime in June. So yet again, we have a regulator who's basically let someone off the hook. And of course, my assumption is they probably said to these people, look, will you get the job done by June here? Because, you know, if you start reporting and you're over the limit, we're going to have to say something. So why don't we just defer the reporting? And that decision, I think, was made about a month ago, if not maybe even six weeks ago. So that's why uh, they didn't need to get an exemption. Dave, he made reference to these new position limits that there are supposed to go into effect in June. So I would suspect the incident that we just saw two weeks ago, if those position limits were to go into effect, that would be prohibited. But what's to stop these entities from lobbying, because they do control the politicians, that there are waivers or the time frame gets extended further out into the future? There is a possibility that the lobbyists would come in and, you know, get the rules changed. It really might sound more positive toward the speculators or silver bowls, but uh, really didn't do as much or have as much teeth as we'd wish. I want to drill down on what he said. He was gave an answer. What he left out, in my view, is that what these exemptions would all revolve around, they revolve around the spot month where the actual metal meets the road, excuse the pun. But uh, let's go back to my little brief about the cattle market. The reason that the authorities came to Ken Roberts and said, what are you doing? You got all these positions on was because it was in the front month or the spot month. And they were scared to death that someone might actually ask for what they bought. Hmm, what a concept. (laughs) Someone that buys cattle wants to actually have them, or someone that buys gold or silver or whatever. And that's why the exemption already exists. Now, he was hinting about this, but he didn't explain it, that the exemption that exists, again, is that you can only have 1,500 contracts in a spot month, 7.5 million ounces which is roughly, what, one-fifth of the total combined inventory held by all registered dealers on the COMEX. So they are protecting themselves. That firewall is already there. And what happens as you get close and there's people that are not rolling their contracts over, in other words, they're not just playing the paper game, they're actually calling the bluff of the counterparty. In other words, a long is calling the bluff of a short in the spot month and refuses to roll over their contract for more paper, but actually sitting there and has the right to buy silver. Well, as long as that right is less than 1,500 contracts, then they can go ahead and execute it. Now, when that takes place, or I may, might say if, it has been my experience that they can receive a phone call. And the phone call basically is, you know, why do you need it? What are you going to do with it? And this type of thing. This is, again, experience on my end. You can take it or leave it. You can use it as hearsay because I can't give you any written proof of that. The point being that certainly there's a lot of exemptions in place, but they always favor one one side. They favor the shorts, not the longs. Now, what he was implying to me and what I've read and actually had an interface with him through one of my subscribers, it wasn't a direct interface, was that I think he understands what's going on and why the physical is so important. And I believe strongly that Bart really, really does want to have an exemption that works fairly on both sides. In other words, the shorts have to have X amount of physical to go short so much in the spot month. The problem is I don't know if they're going to do it in the back months. And that's where the real problem exists. Because as I wrote so long ago for you, Jim, I think the first time after we had our first couple of interviews, please write something about you know the manipulation of the market. And I certainly don't remember the article exactly, but I remember the essence of it. 
of it. And I said, for a very long time, the market doesn't care what the buying or selling pressure is because all markets move on either buying or selling pressure. And for a very long time, out of a huge amount of selling pressure on paper, we'll take this market down over and over. But there will be a day where it does matter. And that is mattering more and more all the time. And I want to reemphasize the point that we talked about on your previous show that I was a guest, and that is how much selling was required. So if we reestablished the actual true amount that was sold on paper to take silver down $2.50 on that day was 550 million ounces, about, as you said, two-thirds of the annual supply of silver. That's what the requirement was to get it $2.50 down. And yet, if you back up a few months previous to that, when the Physical Silver Trust added 10 million ounces, it took the price up approximately 250. So again, I really want to emphasize for people that the physical actually has more effect on the market than the paper market. Why? Because the real market, the physical market, only takes 10 million ounces to move a price up 250, but the paper market requires 55 times more selling to take it down the same amount. So I really believe that we are on the cusp of seeing this market go the way I've always predicted, and that is there will be a day where they exchange or not is it going to matter that the physical market will take command, and there isn't a whole lot that can be done about it at that time. The problem is that the COMEX is kind of a showboat, showcase situation. Everyone focuses on that because it is the price-setting mechanism, and I understand that. But what a lot of people don't understand is that it's really a small player as far as how much physical moves around the world. Almost all of the silver, almost all of it, comes direct pipeline from the smelters to the silver users. And there's an association called the Silver Users Association that's existed for a very long time. And these silver users have a very nice relationship with the major smelting and refining entities worldwide. So they're not that concerned with having to get any silver from the registered dealers on the COMEX, that's almost a side issue. It's a sideshow for them. They've got their silver locked into contracts that probably have nothing to do, I should say nothing to do, but have something to do with the price. But these are contracts that are established on the -the over-the-counter market that really no one's privy to. And yet, these hedge books that run all this paper games have basically unlimited access to sell whatever they feel necessary to put the market in a position where they want it. Let's say for an example, and this is going off the radar a bit because this is not what I believe, but let's just say there was a collusion. And let's say that the edict was, we need to take the price of silver down 250 on this day. Now, I really doubt that that happened. I don't believe that that kind of a direct conspiracy exists. But let's just, for talking purposes, assume that it did. So the edict is, by the close, this market must be down at least $2.50 Sell as much as you have to to get it down to that price. Well, we know what the answer is. You have to sell two-thirds of the world's annual production on a day to get it to move down that much. So, again, I think that we are in a position where those people that have been patiently waiting for the silver price to explode, I'm not sure it's going to explode at this point. I think this year it's going to edge up. I think it's going to be higher by the end of the year. I think we're going to be you know, well over the $45 level by the end of the year. These things take time. But I don't want anyone to give up thinking that, you know, the paper players control the market because that's just not the case. Dave, I wonder if there's an innate bias by government because governments and central banks have always been concerned about inflation. So rising commodity prices, whether it's cattle, whether it's silver or oil, the government always gets concerned whenever a particular commodity market starts to rise. So there may be an innate bias against long positions that would move the price up because that's going to move the inflation rate, possibly interest rates. So perhaps that's why they are so strict on your friend like Ken Roberts when he was taking a major position in cattle or the Hunt brothers back in the late 1970s when they were taking a major position in silver. And then on the other hand, they are more lenient when it comes to short selling because anything that drives the price of a commodity down helps on the inflationary front. Jim, I agree. I think that that makes a lot of sense, and I think that is part of the reason for the bias. You know, when the commodities market started, the intent was very, very good. It was a way to lay off risk, and that intent 
is still established, but the markets are so out of control because there's so much gearing, there's so much going on that have nothing to do with the actual underlying commodity. I think the system just needs a hard look from top to bottom, and it should revolve pretty much around the physical market. In other words, if I was going to implement a rule, I would state that you couldn't ever, no matter what the commodity, hedge more than a year. I mean, you only have a crop that's good for a year, and you only mine so much silver in a year, or you only, you know, grow so much corn. I'm not talking about the financials now. I'm talking about all the other commodities, the softs, the ags, the metals. But, you know, that makes common sense. I don't know. But what you said, I think, is very, very correct. There is a bias here. Going back again to, I think, one of our first shows in the early 2000s, I made a call, and I think you agreed with me that we had seen the end of the mega trend. We're going from the era of from things that you want to things that we need. We're going from a top in the stock market around 2000 to a bottom in the commodity markets. And from then on, you're going to see things that we need, which is basically the commodity sector, increase in price and a huge mega trend that's probably going to last for 15, maybe 20 years. And the stock market is really not going to do that well at the same time frame. And so far, that call has been accurate, and I continue to believe that's the situation. And governments, as you say, Jim, are probably doing their best to keep the genie in the bottle. Look at what they've done. Two of the most important commodities that exist, energy, oil, and food, both those things are rather essential for human life. Both are considered commodities, and yet they take them out of the CPI. Why? Well, because they want to bias it so much. The two essentials that humans need the most aren't even reflected in the consumer price index. Give me a break. I mean, they think we're, what, second-grade kids or something? I mean, there needs to be some adults running some of these agencies, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, that's, you know, not what we see very often. I want to come back to the silver market once again in terms of, you know, you're looking into it, it would appear that there have been some attempts going back to people predicting when the price would rise and fall. But if you look at the silver market, some would argue you can manipulate it in the short term, you can't do it in the long term. And if we look at the last decade, silver's gone from 4 to 48, but it's at close to 30. So 4 to 30, that's a significant move. Yep. Gold has gone from 250 to 1620. But some people would argue that if there wasn't this manipulation or the appearance manipulation, the silver to gold ratio, which is at 55, would be much lower than it is today, maybe along the lines of where it was in the last, let's say, bull market in the 70s. How would you respond to those arguments? Well, I'm not a market forecaster, and anybody that would be thinking they want to take my advice would be in big trouble. And uh, so I, I'm very hesitant to say what I think is going to happen in markets. My job is to make sure that they're free and fair, which is why I have raised some concerns about silver. But that said, you know, I think there is arguments on both sides, Jim. There, there are people out there who say, you know, once the big bad government finally controls this manipulation, the price of silver, the price of gold is going to go sky high. And you hear that a lot from people who want to, what, sell silver to you. They want to encourage, and no matter how high silver gets, but if you just buy more, once the government gets out of the way or once the government controls this nefarious manipulation, then, the boy, the roof's going to blow off silver. So, you know, again, I'm not a market expert. I'm not saying buy or don't buy. But I am saying be careful of folks who make claims about what's going to happen. Be careful with your money. Don't invest money that you think that you can't afford to lose. These are naturally risky markets, and I'd hate to see anybody lose their kid's college fund or their retirement or money they need for health care. So if you're investing, make sure it's money that you're investing wisely. Now, Eric, obviously, he's working for the government. He can't give investment advice, but, you know, this ratio of 50 to 1, where it is on the day you and I are speaking, and you're talking about in the fiscal market, that ratio is 6.5 to 1. Certainly, if we would not have these big drop-downs that we've seen, especially over the last probably 6 to 8 months, one would suspect, Eric, that that ratio would be much, much lower. But I guess maybe the good news here is it only takes a small amount of buying to drive the price up. And to this latest escapade, it took almost 22 times the amount of short selling to bring it down. So, Eric, are they losing this battle? Because on the day they took silver down, 
I called up my dealer and I bought silver. I said, you want to take it down to that price? You just put silver on sale for me. And talking to various dealers that day, and I know your daughter deals in bullion, the phones were ringing off the hook, people taking advantage of this. This, to me, just spells out that in the long run, they're going to lose this battle. First of all, I'd say I admire Commissioner Chilton for standing in there. I don't admire him for the lack of progress. Like, I'm surprised that he could express the views he had, and yet nothing's happened. And these views that uh, you quoted were probably made 50 months ago or maybe even two years ago, and yet nothing's happened. Further exemptions, you know, extended reporting periods, things like that. And I don't buy into the argument that, you know, people who are saying it should go to this level are people who are trying to sell you silver. Uh, although a lot of us are because we see the, the obviousness of it, right? I mean, it's, it's fairly conclusive to go from, well, something's manipulated and there's going to be a shortage to say you should buy. I mean, that, that's common sense. I mean, it's like people who are warning about a housing crisis. All of us said, oh, well, how can they say that? They're just trying to profit because shorts, because stocks are going to go down or the economy is going to be weak or whatever. Well, sure enough, they ended up being right. And they were, of course, in the minority. And those of us who speak out about silver and, and gold are in the minority. I mean, there, there's probably, you know, 100 or 200 people in the world that are willing to put their views out there suggesting that something's wrong. And as there were probably very few people that were vocal about the housing market when it was peaking. So I don't think that, uh, you know, characterizing people who suggest buying silver are shills. I think it's because we've looked at all the data. We look at what goes on in the market and we see the obviousness of what's transpiring. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, we might be making some headway with some of the producers. As you know, we asked some of the producers not to sell silver. We actually, in our last issue, got two of the producers that bought our silver trust. We've seen other companies delay selling because they realize what's going on in the market. And I think this kind of action that happened on leap year day, when we next speak to silver producers, they say, do you see what's happening here? Do you see 225 million ounces sold in an hour? What, what, do you not think that somebody's manipulating this market? And I don't know why their conclusion couldn't be otherwise. And therefore, you've got to stand in and do something about it because you can't let the paper guys just determine your fate here. So again, I mean, uh, I keep saying it. I think we'll win the battle. I don't think we're just saying it because, you know, we are disposed to be buying silver or gold. I think the facts speak for themselves, and in due course, we'll win the battle. Dave, he's sort of implying there that there's a lot more hype in the silver market, and if the government can just get the bad guys out of the way, it's to the moon. But still, it's sort of, he didn't really address what I thought was the, the fact that this silver ratio... And, Eric, you had uh, mentioned that in terms of physical silver to gold, that ratio is probably six and a half. Dave, what are your thoughts as you heard him address that question? Well, a couple things. First of all, the ratio obviously is favoring silver from the inception because it started 80 to 1, we're now 51, which proves that silver has outperformed gold from the beginning of the bull market. I also think that by the time the bull market ends, you'll see the classic or monetary ratio, which is 16 to 1 or perhaps even 10 to 1. There's lots of reasons for that, and I really don't want to go into that deeply because I really would rather address what I think is a more significant look at what Mr. Chilton had to say. And that is what he said that makes perfect common sense within the paradigm that he's working in. And the paradigm that he's working in is that fiat money, paper money, is something that holds value, and you'll be able to sell the silver. In other words, all these people, no matter high how high it gets, will be wanting to sell you silver. That's true until the paradigm breaks down, and I believe we're on the cusp of the whole system breaking down, and this is one of my foremost tenets of why you should have a 10 or 20% interest in physical precious metal, because there has been proven time and time again, in fact, the only almost certainty that you can say is that all fiat money eventually fails. And I think we're, again, on the cusp of that. So it's a different paradigm. My paradigm is different than Mr. Chilton's. My paradigm is there'll be silver people that sales people or silver shops or bullion dealers or coin dealers that will stop selling it because they realize that that has more value 
than selling for paper because the paper markets are in such disarray that no one is trusting them at all. And we're already seeing that on a macro level. I mean, you're seeing that China and Russia have signed agreements where they are going to trade with each other's currency directly without going through the U.S. dollar. So I think it was today or yesterday where Japan is going to be buying some Chinese debt. I mean, India is doing the same thing. So a lot of these major nation states are finding ways to circumvent and get out of the dollar exposure that's so pervasive on a global basis. And most Americans are oblivious to this fact. The only currencies that have ever held up in these types of circumstances have been gold and silver. So my paradigm is different. I'm looking at it as a preservation of capital or perhaps capital appreciation, where that ounce of silver buys you a lot more two years from now than it will buy you today. I'm not looking at it in the paradigm that paper money is going to last forever and everyone wants to sell it to get that high paper price so you can take those paper dollars and do whatever you want with. Consider the fact that even the Federal Reserve admits that the dollar since the establishment of the Fed is down almost 97%. I mean, their job, their mandate is to have stable monetary policy. If that's stable, I'd like to see what unstable is. Dave, do you think in the end, because of the, there's been a lot of manipulation in our commodity markets, whether you're looking at gold, oil, and there have been a lot of people that have documented this. Uh, you've addressed it, Ted Butler, Eric, you've addressed this, as well as numerous writings at Sprott. Do you think that eventually, when you find a market that where you can't trust the integrity of that market, where contract law doesn't hold any validity in the court system, uh, just take a look at what happened to owners of Greek debt, that markets will find a place where they can do business. In other words, the, the U.S. could lose its prominence in terms of uh, commodity trading. In other words, uh, other markets spring up, and that's where people do trading because they have a lot more faith in the integrity of another market. Absolutely, Jim. I believe that's the case. In fact, you had this uh, market that was going to take place in the Asian sector that basically didn't take hold, but yet there's another one coming along, and I don't have all the details, so I don't want to misspeak, but generally that's it. Markets tend to, to strive to be free, and even though there can be all kinds of regulations surrounding them, free markets actually rule the day over the longer term. What I mean by that is look at the example of the black market. I mean, the black market is usually the free market. I mean, for in looking at the Soviet Union as an example, you had the official prices for certain things and all these mandates. Yet, if you knew the right people in the right places, you could probably get almost anything you wanted or needed if you were willing to pay the price. And, you know, I've studied economics basically my entire life, and I don't have all the answers. But what I have found is that the number one most important thing that makes the market work the best is freedom. And that's what free markets are about. It's a free exchange, not only of ideas, which is philosophical, but the free market means that I have the ability to sell something to you for whatever I want. Let's say it's silver coins. And when we make that exchange, we both feel we have benefited. I have got something from you, Jim, a book I've, I've really wanted, and, and you've got two, and you're going to sell me, and I'm going to give you some silver for that. You would rather have the silver than the book, and I'd rather have the book than the silver. That's the free market. It's that simple. But when you get someone to regulate that, no, if you sell a book, there's this other tax on it or there's this, you know, whatever, and, and just goes on and on. And we've just gotten away from the basic, simple, common sense ideas that really made things flourish. And we've just convoluted it so much. As you said, Jim, when the contract law system breaks down, the one thing, and this is going on a bit long, but I just want to make one more point. All the studies that go on about what made America great, there are several academics that have different theories, but I've, I've come to the conclusion that there's really one, and that's the rule of law. When someone says they're going to do something and they do it, that, that's basically contract law. That's the essence of it. That's where you have a stable, honest, fair, free-flowing society where everyone can maximize their own abilities and skill levels to make the society at large better, better, and better still. And that's the vision of labor. And that's what makes things so good and made it so fantastic in the United States of America for so long. But unfortunately, at this point in time, that's really something that's been far, far, far in the past. And I think there are people that are waking up to the fact that something that simple that makes that much common sense is something that we need to restore if we're ever going to get ourselves out of the mess that we've currently put ourselves in. 
Well, I guess maybe, Eric, if there's some good news here, I, I remember, and you, you remember this as well, in the last decade, at the beginning of the last decade, silver would get down to $4 an ounce. They'd cover their short position. It'd get back up to 5 They would go uh, short. That lasted for a couple of years, and, and on the day you and I are speaking, silver is closer to $34 an ounce. But on that leap year takedown, what the message that I got, and I called up five dealers, in addition to buying myself, just about every single one of the dealers I talked to were telling me that people were calling up and buying silver. So they're going to lose this battle because when they take down silver, if you want to accumulate it, as you and I do, I just see that as an opportunity. And I suspect, uh, Eric, on that day that uh, your daughter was doing a brisk business in uh, silver. Yeah, there's no doubt that Sprott Money uh, was a recipient of uh, an outsized number of orders that day. Uh, you know, Jim, it's also been suggested that the Chinese lay in waiting here. There were some comments out of London that uh, they were very big buyers at uh, 34 and 33 and took out significant amounts of physical silver. So that's fine if they want to play that game and... Uh, you know, one of the things that I believe is that if I was a non-G6 nation, because the G6 nations just said to the banks, you can borrow all you want, and obviously China is a non-G6 nation, I don't know why they'd buy the bonds anymore. And we're seeing more and more evidence that non-G6 nations think, well, what's going on in those G6 countries? I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't want to own that paper. I want to own physical. And we've seen even tangible evidence of that today with the... Uh, Chinese trade uh, surplus becoming uh, a deficit because we're huge buyers of physical things. So ultimately, you know, we're going to win the war. It's just frustrating all the way along that we have to put up with these sh- the shenanigans. And I mean, I'm probably mischaracterizing the shenanigans because people are profiting by this and they're profiting illegally. So hopefully it will come to an end soon. Well, I agree with you, Eric, and I want to thank you for coming on the program and sharing your thoughts because, uh, once again, it's taking increasingly larger and larger amounts to keep the price of silver down, and they can't keep it down for very long, and it starts to go right back up again just because of the very issues that you've been talking about. The ratio of silver to gold is probably 6.5 to 1, and you can't maintain that ratio with buying occurring. And don't you think, Eric, as well, when it comes to silver, as the price of gold goes up, and it's 1700 1800 for the average person on the street, how many people can go out and buy a gold maple leaf, a, a gold eagle, that silver throughout human history has always been the money of the common man? Right. And I might even add, and that's absolutely true, Jim, but what would happen if, like, I think the markets made gold the reserve currency. When I look at what it's done versus all the currencies, I mean, it's no contest, right? It's ridiculous. And if gold's the, the uh, reserve currency, you need something to trade on a day-to-day basis, and that ultimately has to be silver. So, you know, we're going to get there. I mean, we can continue to see the debasement of currencies, the printing of money. And, you know, it's difficult for people to maintain their courage in this environment, but uh, that's what's necessary. Well, it seems to me, Eric, that uh, if they keep doing this and as demand keeps coming in, people like yourself are not going to stop buying silver. People like myself are not going to stop buying silver. So we know this is going much higher. Dave, any final thoughts as we conclude? No, those are my final thoughts, but I appreciate the opportunity to go at this level, because I think uh, everyone's going to pay a lot of attention to, to what uh, Commissioner Chilton has to say. And I guess one more comment. I really think in my heart of hearts, he really has the right intent in mind. I really do think he's a good guy. I don't know many others. I have had exchange with Bart a few times by email only. Uh, I have called his office a couple times, not spoken with the man. But a lot of information I get from my subscribers, I've seen all kinds of correspondence from BART to them, and from the best I can determine, I think he really does want to affect a positive change in the silver market. You know, Dave, I would agree with you. I think he is a good man, but, you know, like all governments, he is constrained by the very entity that he works for. Uh, You know, I'm sure all of us have stories about dealing with the government bureaucracy. Well, listen, Dave and Eric, I'd like to thank you both for joining us on the program. I wish you well, and hopefully uh, as we go forward, as you mentioned, Dave, the paper market eventually is going to lose the game. And the point that I would make to our listeners is, Dave, when you first introduced me to the concept of silver back in 2001, and I give you credit for that, I never thought of silver, I was thinking of gold, 
the price of silver was at four dollars. You know, we're talking about silver now at over thirty-three dollars an ounce. So certainly, if they're trying to contain the bull market in silver, they're definitely losing the game. The fact that it took almost two thirds of the world's silver production to take silver down two dollars speaks volumes of what's ahead for the price of silver. All right, that concludes our special edition of the Financial Sense News Hour as we looked at manipulation in the silver market. I hope we provided some useful information. You can form your own opinion by those given here on the program today. But if you would like to find out more about the guest on the program, you can do so by going to sprott.com. That's S P R O T T dot com in silver hyphen investor.com if you want to find and follow Dave Morgan's work. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to both of them for joining us in this virtual roundtable as we've taken a look at the silver market. Well, here we are at the end of another program, 278 days until the last program that we'll ever, ever do, because we know that the Mayan calendar says the world will end on December 21st. At least that's the fun everybody's happening. But just in case it doesn't, if you're here on December 22nd, we'll think about continuing the show after that. And in between then, Jim, what are we going to do? I have no idea. <laughs> Well, we probably won't have any idea after the 21st of December either, but... Haven't thought out that far. No, we're going to be taking a look at a lot of topics. We're going to handle the topic of deflation with a well-known deflationist coming up in the weeks ahead. We're going to also look into the issue of energy because we've had a lot of questions. And, of course, the politicals are basically, you know, it happens, John. The United States has no energy policy. And any time the price rises, when you shut down drilling, make it difficult to open open up a refinery or put in all these regulations and you wonder why the price of energy goes up well who are the two scapegoats usually it's the oil companies or the speculators and we've heard from both so we're going to look at the issue of energy coming up in the weeks ahead so a lot of great stuff coming up and as i said this is one of those years where it is a political election year, a big one, not only here in the United States and elsewhere around. So a lot of funny stuff that we're going to be hearing from politicians. We'll be here to talk about it. In the meantime, on behalf of John Leffler and myself, we'd like to thank you for joining us here on the program. Until you and I talk again, we hope you have a pleasant weekend. Subscribe to Financial Sense News Hour in the iTunes and BlackBerry podcast libraries or at feeds.feedburner.com slash FSN. Find more information about our guests at www.financialsense.com slash news hour. Friend us at www.facebook.com slash financial sense online. For our on the go listeners, you can access Financial Sense on your mobile device at m.financialsense.com. The Financial Sense News Hour is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the News Hour each involve their own unique risk factors, which are not discussed on the show. Responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of James Poplava and do not take into account listeners' suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Financial Sense News Hour and its parent company shall not be liable for any financial losses that result from investing in any companies profiled on or advertising with Financial Sense or arising out of the use of any material on the News Hour. Be advised that you invest at your own risk. <laughs>